Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by Arc. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by Arc or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by Arc to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI for Your Innovation, ARC's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. Today, we're speaking to Daniel Dornbush, who is the CEO of Excision Biotherapeutics, which is a company that delivers CRISPR based products to cure viral infectious diseases. Daniel has more than 20 years of pharmaceutical and biotech experience at companies including Novartis, where he was head of commercial for Latin America for vaccines and HIV diagnostics, and Genentech, where he was head of the medical education group, and many other companies, including Genzyme. Daniel received his BA in biology and English from Cornell University and a master's of science from Tufts University School of Medicine and Emerson College and he received his MBA from Harvard Business School. Welcome, Daniel. We're so happy to have you on the podcast today. Thanks so much, Ali. Great to be with you. Awesome. So, you know, we've been seeing research on gene editing and different modalities for years now, but can you provide a high-level description of what gene editing is? And since it has been around for decades, why, in your opinion, is gene editing really getting into the spotlight now? Oh, great question. So gene editing, as you mentioned, has been around for decades and there's lots of we call them flavors, different ways to gene edit. So I guess backing up, what is it? If you look at the human genetic code, all three billion base pairs in every cell in our body, or most of them anyway, this you can think about it as a book, a screenplay, some sort of map that creates all of the different functions, right? What makes an eye an eye, skin, skin, muscle, muscle makes every organism work. And by editing that code, you can change function of different things. When the code works perfectly, of course, you get healthy individuals and animals and plants. When things go awry, you can have things like cancer or birth defects or or things that are, we call them abnormal, but really it's different expressions of genes. And that is where gene editors come in. And there's, as I mentioned, several different flavors. Some of the ones that have been investigated most commonly over the years have been zinc fingers, meganucleases, talons. These are different descriptions of different proteins and different uh, applications that scientists have used in order to edit the genes. And you can do anything from adding an entirely new gene. So there are companies and groups and research institutions out there adding, for example, normal hemophilia genes for patients and people who have abnormal clotting factors or sickle cell disease to put in the appropriate genetic sequence so patients don't uh, have all of the side effects of sickling. We at Excision are using gene editors in order to remove something, quite a different take on gene editing, but actually more along the lines of what things like CRISPR were designed to do biologically in bacteria to start with. Interesting that you mentioned that CRISPR is bacteria. So do you think that that gives virus treatment protocols or vaccines an edge because CRISPR is a bacteria, even though obviously we know that there is a clear differentiation between bacteria and viruses? Uh, There's so many levels to that question you ask. Okay, so CRISPR is part of or was discovered in bacteria first. In fact, there are now people call them uh, CRISPR hunters. People scouring the world from everything from high altitudes in Colorado to underwater bacteria near volcanic vents looking for rare bacteria and looking for new gene editors in CRISPR. So CRISPR was bacteria's way to avoid viral infectious diseases. So they've got proteins that they make from their DNA, creating these CRISPR proteins. And when they're infected by viruses that can kill them, 
they've got a unique way of going in and cutting up viral DNA, they call it plasma DNA for bacteria. This was described as CRISPR. That's been around for quite some time and, and described as in bacteria for quite some time. The new innovation that you hear quite a lot about purported to be uh, the uh, a Nobel Prize winning discovery in the next few years, possibly. Jennifer Doudna, Feng Zhang, UC Berkeley, MIT, so many companies, so many applications, so now so many new potential therapeutics with it. That innovation was the ability to change and harness the power of the CRISPR editor to design different actions, to put it to essentially our own use. Can you add a gene? Can you remove a gene? Can you change a gene? And there's lots of great new discoveries of, of how to tweak it, how to change it up. Are you changing one letter in the entire book of your uh, genetic code? Are you changing a whole page, meaning quite a few letters? Are you removing a whole chapter? What would you need to do to have the desired effect? And that's really the power of different gene editors uh, and, and CRISPR. That makes a lot of sense. And as you mentioned, gene editing is being used for sickle cell and hemophilia and a bunch of different other indications. So why would gene editing be a good idea for viruses specifically, which is one of your focus? One of the things that viral infectious diseases have challenged new therapeutics and researchers for so many decades is the difference between the, the sort of term cure and treatment. And there are some great treatments for so many viral infectious diseases, right? Uh, hepatitis C, Gilead launched a great product several years ago, or multiple products that are now essentially a cure for almost every patient with hepatitis C. HIV is a bit different. Lots of therapeutics now are on the market that can control people's viral infections and have them live almost normal lives close to it. However, none of those therapies for diseases such as HIV or hepatitis or herpes virus, which we're working on, all three of those, nothing cures it. And one of the fundamental targets of what we're looking for is how do you go right at the source of the infection, right? All of the therapeutics will attack and treat the expression of the HIV DNA, but nothing goes and removes the HIV DNA. So that's what we're doing. Why viral infectious diseases? Because we now have the tools to go after the source of these infections and edit them. That's why we call it excision. We're excising the viral genome from living animals. So we've become the first company in history to essentially create a functional cure of an animal and remove HIV genomes from living animals. Amazing. That's incredible. And I think it would be really helpful then if you could explain a little bit more about how this HIV curative treatment works and why is it really differentiated between your treatment and maybe what a vaccine would do? We approach it by, as I mentioned, going after the actual HIV DNA that's infected uh, an individual's or, or animal cells. So when HIV infects, it puts DNA right into the DNA, its DNA, into the DNA of the host. We call these retroviruses. They, they're inserting their own DNA so that our natural proteins and things that express our DNA go right through and duplicate the, vac the viral DNA along with it. Our therapeutic would go in. What we're doing is we're delivering, actually, we're hijacking a viral vector. So we're taking essentially a, the viral coat, which have been very effective and are now the products of multiple approved products around the world taking a viral vector and inserting the DNA for CRISPR, as well as specific guides. And these are small, think of them as 20 letters long, approximately, that bind to HIV sequences only. And then the CRISPR gets expressed and cuts out the viral DNA. Now, several steps from what we just talked about, it has to get into the nucleus, it has to be expressed, it has to bind to the HIV or whatever uh, hepatitis B DNA, and then cut it. We've been able to show this. It's taken many years to get there and to show each of those steps. And we've got lots of peer-reviewed publications showing all the steps along those ways. And really, it's not just our company, but dozens of companies and large research institutions, university labs that have achieved all of these different steps. 
And what's exciting these days is how different companies and different research groups are applying those innovations, different combinations of innovations, different ways to do this. Ours to remove viral infectious diseases is certainly one way. As you mentioned, vaccines would be a, a whole different approach. Vaccines fundamentally help the immune system learn how to defeat a new infection. Think about the flu virus every year. What you do is you go get a, a flu vaccine. It trains the immune system to fight that infection. Essentially, it, it's why you don't get the same flu year after year, or at least if you do, it's a, a shorter course and not as severe because your body has already created cells that recognize that flu virus and can mount an immune response quickly. So what you're essentially doing is teaching the immune system to mount an immune response. Now, a vaccine wouldn't go after and cure a patient or a person who has been infected with a viral infectious disease. It could prevent a new infection, but it won't be a treatment. And that's sort of where we make the distinction between what we're working on, which is a potential cure approach, versus the many vaccine approaches that are in development. Interesting. And what made you think to go after HIV? It's obviously a, a tall order. So what was uh, some of the making process for that? Deciding indeed. Uh, and, and part of that is uh, certainly HIV, hepatitis B, which we also have concerted efforts to go and cure. That's a, an indication with well over 250 million people around the world. Herpes virus, there's data showing that there's potentially a billion people around the world infected, infected with that one. But to get to your question on why HIV, I think that ever since HIV was discovered, articulated, and analyzed back in the 80s, I, I don't know if there's a researcher out there in HIV that hasn't dreamed of a cure. It is something we all aspire to have done. Nothing so far uh, that I've seen has achieved a, a cure, certainly in, in, in people, but we're trying to do it. We hope to be in clinical trials early next year in just a few months. And with our curative strategy, let's uh, hope this works and, and changes the ballgame for HIV. So really interesting. And how you're doing that, obviously, through a gene editing approach. But, you know, one of the interesting parts that I've always found about gene editing is the crazy IP landscape. And so I know that you have an exclusive license for CASX from the University of California. I think it'd be helpful if maybe you explain first, what is CASX? What is a nuclease in general? And why would that be the best nuclease for gene editing for viruses? This is a really fun area of biology these days. We've been lucky enough to work with the Jennifer Dowden's team out of UC Berkeley and have a license to, as you mentioned, CASX and CASY. Now, let's, what are these and, and how does this work? So CRISPR is a term that describes hundreds of types, possibly thousands of types of proteins. And so these are small proteins that would float around and they are very efficient at cutting DNA. Now there's multiple parts. The CRISPR protein itself will do the cutting. Think of it as a sort of an automated ax that can come in and cut DNA. But in order for the ax to figure out where to cut, it needs something called the guide. We call it a piece of RNA. So it's, it binds to DNA and will match up the letters uh, specifically then the CRISPR comes over, sees its guide, knows where to cut. Now, there are, as I mentioned, hundreds, maybe thousands of different proteins and these automated axes that we can uh, now make in, in different cell lines. The most famous is Cas9. That one has been the subject of, as you say, many a lawsuit, but also many a clinical trial and certainly research in animals. In, and it's probably the best described or at least most published editor out there. Nevertheless, there are many others. So the Cas9 is just the ninth family, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Cas X and Y are part of the Cas12 family. And if you actually look at how these, it, it looks like a giant spider web or, or even a, a family tree is probably a better way to describe it where if you have a family of Cas, whatever, 9, 11, 12, you then have 
dozens and hundreds of different editors within those families that uh, have different traits. Some of them cut single-stranded DNA, some cut one, some cut one base pair, some can cut all over the genome. There's, they have different properties. What we've found is that Cas9 is, is, of course, as described and written in the literature and, uh, by lots of groups, very efficient. Cas X and Y are actually slightly smaller and perhaps even more efficient. It, it's hard to say more or less because you have to compare it in lots of different ways in order to make any definitive descriptions of one or another. But they all have slightly different abilities slightly different, better or worse, in different applications. We've found Cas X and Y to be uh, just very effective for the type of specific editing we're looking for to remove viral DNA. And we touched on this a little bit, just the, the strong importance around patenting and gene editing. So maybe we can go a little deeper into the relevance of patenting into the gene editing space in general, and then maybe even more so in, in your role specifically. Sure. The Cas9, it, it, usually when people think of CRISPR, IP, and, and battles, they think about the, the, the Cas9 uh, field. That is subject of many lawsuits between MIT and UC Berkeley, Feng Zhang's lab and Jennifer Doudna's lab. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and is being battled about uh, even today and will probably be battled out for quite a long time. Where I think a lot of the companies and research institutions these days are focusing their efforts on well, why, why work in places that others are when there's so many gene editors out there, lots of options. So you can almost see almost by the month, there's new companies being formed, new research being done on brand new gene editors that may even be better, perhaps, than Cas9 or some of the ones already described. So there are CRISPR hunters that are, are new CRISPR developers that are coming up with new types of editors and then working very hard on describing how do these actually work? How do they compare to others? Do they cut better? Do they cut worse? Are they more specific? For us, we're looking for something that is very specific. We want to be able to cut the, the, the viral gene, but leave the human sequence alone. That's going to be fundamental. And, and whether you're talking about the vaccine approach to immunity or therapeutic approach like we are, Every drug, perhaps in the, in the history of drugs, there's always a, a balance between efficacy and safety. And what we are fortunate in our approach is the viral genetic code looks very different than the human genetic code. And we're able to, def to identify sequences within viruses that we can cut very reliably at those locations that don't have any similarity to the sequences within human codes. This is right at the heart of how can we be the most specific to viruses only and not to humans. And what we call it in gene editing is off-target effects. How can you make sure that you're not having off-target effects? The big concern here is that if you have edited an area in a human genome that you is unintended, could that create cancer? That's one way, possibly, that just like UV rays can disrupt the genetic code with uh, some sort of a cut or a slightly mutation, so can a gene editor, potentially. And, and that's really, the I think, the biggest concern and lots of what the FDA and regulatory agencies around the world are, are interested in. Are you targeting or do you have any potential off-target cuts in an oncogene? Could you potentially cut the DNA in a place which could create cancer and thereby have a bad side effect? We haven't seen it in our preclinical models and in any of the research we've done. Most of the companies I see in clinical trials and products don't have any of that, which is why it's taken quite a long time. You mentioned one of the earlier questions, why now? It's taken us quite some time to find gene editors that are that specific to not cause off-target effects, not cause side effects. But maybe fundamentally, and where we're seeing this so quickly these days, is in all of the technologies that have come to fruition and maturity that enable the gene editing. And what I really mean is diagnostics, gene sequencing, PCR, single cell PCR, different techniques and really bioinformatics that have come to be commonplace within research institutions that can get 
levels of resolution and acuity of what are these gene editors actually doing to cells all over an, an organism and individual. Those are really powerful and essential to make sure that these gene editors are doing what they're doing and not doing something we don't want them to do. Definitely. And, you know, when we're talking about vaccines and diagnostics, it's obviously making me think of COVID-19. You know, the current pandemic is, is obviously certainly top of mind. So I'm just curious, do you think that a gene edited vaccine may be a good approach for future pandemics? Obviously not endorsing. We hope we don't have any future pandemics, but being prepared is always helpful. So just from a vaccine perspective, would it be would it make sense to have a gene editing vaccine? Would you see this still as maybe a gene editing curative treatment? What's kind of your thought on on the pandemic situation? So gene editing vaccines have been really, I think, uh, a cornerstone of why we've moved we the, the entire scientific community and, and global research community and, and drug development community has moved so fast with new virus vaccines for. SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you know, look, uh, unfortunately, we've seen it before, right? SARS-CoV-1 uh, was several years ago, then MERS. Now we've, we've seen coronaviruses before. And so we unfortunately know this is going to be coming back. And now gene editing has really accelerated the vaccine development in, in quite a number of ways. The, the traditional way to do a vaccine, it's probably worth 30 seconds, is either to weaken the virus or to kill the virus, or to take a piece of the virus, and you train the immune system. But to go through each of those steps is t often takes many years. For example, the when Ebola, uh, of course, was a, a threat several years ago, there was a whole uh, effort to create an Ebola vaccine. That was fast-tracked by the FDA. That took five years to get to clinical trials. We've now seen from discovery of SARS-CoV-2 to first patients in in about five months, which is late. I know the press all talks about lightning speed, but this is really unprecedented speed for any drug development, certainly vaccine development. And a lot of that has to do with the gene editing. Why gene editing is sped it up? Well, it's much more specific to how to change the drugs and, and make something specific, meaning can you take the pieces of the virus and embed it into a package, whether that's into a, 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 a larger piece of DNA, a plasmid, whether that's into, a, you know, actually a fat bubble called lipids, or put it into an empty virus, like sort of the way excisions are approaching it, and then getting that into a patient. We can actually, we can engineer it, right? It's much faster to do a 3D printer approach than it is to grow something with generations and generations and generations of plants or grow it within an animal or an egg as it does, happens to be with vaccines. So it's just that much faster. Now, to, to get to your question about how the, the vaccines can be applied with SARS-CoV-2, well, one of the challenges is we know with the flu virus that every year the flu virus mutates and we need a new vaccine. So one challenge with SARS-CoV-2 is should there be a SARS-CoV-3? Hopefully not, but if history serves, it may be at some point. It's probably not an if, it's a when. Hopefully, it won't be anywhere near as virulent as this one. It may just hopefully peter out like the last. But if it doesn't, we're, we're learning a lot about coronaviruses and the approach to these. In fact, the, the world has have seen coronaviruses for, for many decades and know how these work and have, have looked at spike proteins. One of the reasons we've been able to go so fast is because there's been a lot of publications over the last decades on, on coronaviruses. This, of course, is a little different uh, and it, it, it acts differently than ones we've seen. But the vaccine approach here is, of course, fundamental to the, 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 the world. Uh, just one word of caution that sort of gets lost, I think, in a lot of the media reports I see is the, the level of immunization that different governments have put on this vaccine, that you know, most of the vaccines go through so many years of, of safety evaluation that they have very high bars, 90 plus percent. You know, how many people do you have to give the vaccine to make them immune? And you usually look for they know, more than 90% of, of people. In this case, because it's such an emergency, the bar has been lowered to about 
for most governments, which is which is relatively low. Hopefully, that's going to be enough to turn the tide and and save thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives. But, but we need to be careful as a, as a community and a, a global community. That is a great point. I think safety is is definitely a huge concern that we all have for the vaccine coming out. There's also a lot of news coming out on Corona and the vaccine front right now. Moderna currently sort of in their phase three most advanced. They're an RNA-based vaccine. Others, you know, following suit behind them like Pfizer and BioNTech. So I guess the question is, could a gene-edited vaccine be a better mousetrap than maybe the traditional adenovirus vaccine like you mentioned earlier, or maybe even then, you know, the DNA or mRNA vaccines that are being tested in the clinic? But, you know, we have to keep in mind they've never been approved. So as you said, safety is really is really paramount. They certainly could be. More effective is, is a hard bar because you'd have to compare them one versus another in order to make that claim. But they certainly can have been able to show that they can move a little bit more quickly through preclinical development. Could they be more effective? It's possible. Could they be safer? Possible. It really needs to be tested. Uh, unfortunately, that's why we have to do clinical trials. As much research and as, as great as a lot of the diagnostics and research techniques have progressed in the last years, there's just no perfect model, unfortunately, for, for new drugs. Uh, we know we do not have a computer model that can model everything within the human body. It's far too complex, orders of magnitude. So we unfortunately don't know until we put it into clinical trials to test. And then also, there's also the level of no matter what we do in clinical trials, it's it's a subset. Companies and governments and and regulatory agencies try to make clinical trials as reflective as possible of the real world, but it's never perfect. And as some people talk about putting the vaccine out into the wild, you can sometimes find something. For example, is there a, if somebody has a rare disease, perhaps, could it create a side effect? We don't know. And that's why there's lots of regulations and, in, and implementations of how to track every single side effect that is ever seen, whether it's directly associated with that or you know, just someone just gets sick on their own. It has nothing to do with the drug. But all of these have to be tracked very carefully. And there's some really clever, innovative ways of, of doing that these days to make it much faster and, and have it be reported and improve along the way in development. Interesting. So, you know, at Excision Biotherapeutics, you know, you guys are using gene editing to cure infectious disease. So just really interesting hearing your comments on mRNA and DNA and some of these newer vaccines and if they may get approved. So I'm just curious why do you think that hasn't your strategy of using sort of the gene editing to cure infectious disease? Why do you think that hasn't been commercialized in the past 40 years? And why do you think it could be now? This is a great question. Uh, this is really the, the reason for being and why this company was created in the first place. So if you go back to gene editors, we talked about how gene editors have been around for decades. And of course, we've known about herpes virus and hepatitis B and HIV for decades. So why haven't we come up with a therapeutic and cured this already? Well, turns out that as it's not for lack of trying. Uh, there are more companies and universities and research groups who have tried to deactivate viruses with drugs, with antibodies, with gene editors to try to cure, essentially to remove and stop viral infections. And they've all failed. And one of the reasons is that viruses have evolved over millennia to avoid that kind of stoppage, frankly, to that kind of stoppage of their replication. And it's even described in literature as the viral escape mechanism. It, it's evolved ways to avoid or mutate so that if you make a cut, if you remove one, one of the letters, five of the letters, even 10 of the letters, the virus just mutates around it. And maybe you deactivate some of them, but there's so many of them that they mutate and go right on replicating. So there have been hundreds of studies in mice and animals and tried to come up with cures using gene editors for these viruses, and they've all failed. Except 
really for one. We published last year that for the first time we were able to remove the genes from living animals of HIV. And what the difference was is instead of making a single cut in a viral sequence, we make two or more. It's kind of a simple concept, but what you actually are doing is by making two or more cuts, you can remove instead of five or 10 base pairs, you can remove thousands of them. And so of the approximately 10,000 letters in the HIV genome, we can remove 1,000, 5,000, 9,000 bases, depending on where our cuts are, that have been shown to deactivate. There's nothing left for the HIV or herpes virus to, to replicate. That's essentially our patent of, of our approach of how to go about this. That's what we're approaching it with, shows that it, it's worked in animals. In fact, we've done a, an animal study where we gave animals our drug, let it cut the DNA, and then we've done essentially bone marrow transplants and spleen transplants from those animals into others and shown that n there are no HIV DNA left in the treated animals. We call it an adoptive transfer study. It's about the gold standard one can do to, to prove that it's actually working. So that's what we're hoping to bring to human clinical trials here in, in just a number of months. And that's a really interesting approach to looking at HIV. Curious on your thoughts on this one. So in 2018, Dr. He Jiankwe created germline edits on babies to actually try and cure HIV. And they were thinking of doing this by editing the CCR5 proteins. So this approach is something that I've heard other labs are thinking about taking as a treatment for HIV. So I'm curious if you think this approach is a potential for adults. Um, of course, we know germline editing is prohibited. And of course, we also know that Dr. Jiankwe is in jail for it. But, but So on that great note, but do you think that this approach potentially could have some validity in adults? That certainly got a lot of press when that uh, was reported for the first time. Yeah, several aspects of your question. The first is gene editing babies. Let's just address that really quickly. Every researcher, every institution, every government I've ever heard of and spoken, spoken to is horrified at that concept of what that individual purportedly did. In fact, it's probably worth mentioning that most of the sophisticated researchers that I've talked to doubt that he actually was able to do what he did or even did what he did. There's several technical hurdles that he would have had to have solved that he really doesn't have the ability to do. In fact, most no, no one has the ability to do. He would have had to solve a lot of technical problems in order to do what he purportedly did. But let's just put that aside. Not only is it illegal, immoral, and ethical to be editing any germline, uh, to essentially editing any baby's DNA, but you asked another part of your question was, is that approach and that approach, meaning the CCR5, the, the, can you go and edit something to hopefully make a person immune to HIV? And that approach is very different. It, it has nothing to do with gene editing babies necessarily. This is an approach that you may have heard of the Berlin patient, Tim Brown, or the London patient, where these are two individuals who were HIV positive and also had acute myeloidic leukemia. They needed bone marrow transplants in order to survive because of their cancer. So in, because they had HIV, researchers said, well, wait a second, why don't we take the blood from a CCR5 mutant, that's called a Delta 32 mutation, from a, an immune person to HIV and put it in these individuals? Okay, so what's a CCR5, Delta 32? So these are patient people that don't have HIV. And these were discovered, it's really kind of amazing when this happened. I, I remember in the, in the 80s and 90s when these were first reported, people who had, who were living with people or, or, or had multiple relationships with people who had HIV were coming into hospital saying, I should have HIV. I have been exposed. However, I'm still HIV negative. What's happening? And so researchers started to look at their blood and they found a common mutation in what's called the CCR5 gene, which the CCR5 protein is one of the ways that, or is one of the ways that HIV attaches to and infects people in the first place. So if that's mutated, the HIV can't bind and the HIV can't infect the person. So they're essentially immune to that strain of HIV. 
So what they did with the London and Berlin patient is they took bone marrow from people with these mutations, they're immune to HIV, and put them in these patients with HIV. And what now most of those bone marrow transplants didn't end up protecting the individuals from, and, and the, those patients had to stay on their antiretroviral therapy. But for two of them, it, it worked, it seemed to, and they came off of their antiretrovirals and they remained HIV negative. Now, you could still detect HIV DNA in both of them, but it didn't infect their immune cells from their bone marrow, which, which produced in the bone marrow. It didn't affect their immune cells, so they didn't develop AIDS. So it's a bit different than our approach. That approach is actually being pursued by some different researchers around the world. Can you go and do some sort of a, can you take bone marrow from people with HIV, edit them outside the body, grow it up and put it back into their body with essentially immune bone marrow? So the concept, there's, there's an, we call it an N of two. There's two individuals that this has worked in so far that we know of. So as a concept, could that work? It seemed, yes, there's, there's, a, uh, there's data on two patients. There are some challenges. Uh, the, maybe the primary one is that bone marrow transplants have about a 20% chance of death. So at the current stage or status of bone marrow transplants, a patient it seems would, be, would have to roll the dice with a one in five chance of dying in order to have this kind of a therapy. So that, that seems to be one of the major impediments to that approach. But we'll see. I know there's lots of very smart people working in that kind of area. We're hoping that it's not only a lot less expensive than our approach, but also a lot more a lot safer to do a gene therapeutic approach using a virus, which is what we do. There are already approved systemic, they call it, if you put it within just into the blood, gene therapies shown to be safe. We hope to do the same thing. That's really interesting because there are 25.4 million people that are using antiretroviral therapy in 2019. But as you mentioned, you can, you can actually live a relatively long and healthy life with HIV now. So people may not want to roll the dice on that 20% chance of death just from the, the, uh, the surgery. So that's definitely a caveat to that theory. Another thing that's definitely been in the news is President Trump mentioned in his goals that one of them was to cure HIV by the time he got out of office. So I'm curious, have you received any funding? Have you spoken to maybe the government or know of any companies that are currently working with the administration on curing HIV? We would love to work with the federal government on, on moving these forward to try to bring a cure to patients within the U.S. and around the world. We have not received any direct funding from the Trump administration on this program. We have received a, a small business, an SBIR grant uh, for some earlier stage research that we're doing on other viruses, but, but not directly for this. We have spoken to a couple of people in the administration. Fortunately, they were very interested in what we were doing, but then SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 happened, and they said, sorry, we are completely busy with, uh, with the current pandemic rather than any other viral infectious diseases. So we hope that perhaps the, there's someone within the Trump administration with dedicated funds. There's, of course, PEPFAR, which is the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, started about uh, 16, 20 years ago now. Really a terrific group. Perhaps there's money there that can help move this forward. So if there is someone, we're, we're happy to discuss how to collaborate with the, with the federal government on this. But, but no, not to date, unfortunately. Daniel, I want to thank you for your time today. And I want to leave the floor to you before we wrap up. Just anything maybe that I missed that you want to highlight from your sort of extensive experience or anything specifically about excision that maybe we didn't cover? Oh, Ali, you've asked terrific questions today. And I think what we've seen with gene editing companies and small companies, large companies, it's really just the start. As I mentioned, part of it is the foundational technologies of, of gene analysis, diagnostics have come so far in helping develop and set the stage for companies to now apply gene therapeutics. And, and this is across, this is crops potentially improved and making sure that it's safe and doing only the things that it's targeted at doing. 
There's companies working on on animals in order to create uh, organs that can be transplanted into humans using gene editing to remove essential genes that, uh, that would facilitate and allow that to happen. And then, of course, the, the very end of what we're talking about today, which is direct therapeutics for people on everything from genetic disease to viral infectious disease. So I think in the next 10 years, we'll see quite a lot of advances in the technology and therapeutics and hopefully opportunities for, for new cures. That's amazing. I can't wait to be <laughs> to be privy to all of it. It's uh, it's really an exciting time for biotech in general, and specifically gene editing. So, well, thank you. Great. You and the yeah. Ark Invest team do an outstanding job helping move the fields forward. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your time today, and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Ark believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that Ark believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.